Not to get it promised that the next Air Force birthday, because we still said here it was birthday. Yeah. And um, Air Force is 103 and he's 104. Yeah. But Bruce, with your kind permission, I'm going to get a microphone for you. Was that okay? Yeah. Well, I said, get a set tight cap for it. That, is, that normally works pretty well. Yep. Try not to break that sweet ball. Bruce, that was so sick of it. Good. Um, uh, there, uh, there, 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 there. Hello, everyone, and it's really wonderful to be sitting here. I feel so absolutely honoured to be sitting here with Bruce Robertson. 104 years old, Bruce, and thank you so much. Here we are in the RAF base at Richmond. 104, Bruce, oh, yeah. is young. <laughs> well, it is. Yes. I haven't grown any older than I feel. That's good. All through my life. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you don't dwell on your age. No. You dwell on the people around you. Mm. You've got to keep them in the right place for all yeah. the wonderful things that Australia is. That's right. We've got to get children to know some of their history, yes. their war history. Yes. Because we won our war history. That's right. We had five battles in the in the um, Second World War, Milne Bay, won by uh, I'm sorry, the Americans had a fleet there that destroyed a Japanese fleet. Yeah. Um, destroyed two aircraft carrier sh warship, warships. Yeah. And so that the Americans, that was only a couple of hundred kilometres off Townsville. Ugh. So it's our area. Mm. Right. And then we had Milne Bay. Mm. And the Japanese landed there. They had warships off the coast. And we had. Uh, soldiers, not a lot, but we had two squadrons of Air Force planes, Kitty Hawks, single engine fighters. Yes. Now, in Milne Bay was a coconut plantation. Lever Brothers in England had a plantation for there. Every, every direction you look was a coconut tree. The Japanese were up in those trees, potty at the Australian soldiers. Right. Now, the kitty hawks flew over right through the palm trees and shot the Japanese out of those trees. Yes. They wore their guns out, had to go back and get refitted and come up and do the same thing again. Hmm. And they were a big part of uh, Milne Bay being won by Australia. Yeah. Well, at Mellon Bay, the Japanese wanted to get to Port Moresby yes. from Mellon Bay, but they couldn't do it. So Kokoda, the track across the middle of New Guinea from the north side to the south. A rugged track too, wasn't it? Well, rugged is just a mild term. Okay. It was absolutely atrocious how the Australians did it. I don't know. I myself... Was Air Force? Yes. What are you talking about, Kokoda track for you, not a soldier? Mm. But I used to be. I trained as a soldier for three years. And what? When? How old were you when you started training? Well, in the, in the army, seventeen. Wow. Mm. Yeah. And so it went on. I, I transferred to the Air Force. Yeah. Why did you do that, Bruce? I loved aeroplanes. <laughs> <laughs> I was. Fortunate with my mother was so clever. Kingsford Smith, Australian flyer. Yeah. Top top in the world. He first one to fly across the Pacific Ocean. Well. And uh, with two Americans uh, in a plane. And when they landed in Sydney, after first landing at Brisbane, then Sydney, they were brought into the city in an open car, standing up in the back and waving people. Yes. To the Hotel Australia and Mark Place in Sydney. Yes. Beautiful hotel. It was, wasn't it? There would have been 10,000 people around that entrance soon. And my mother said, got no hope of seeing them here. Let's go across the road to the other curb. There was no one there. Oh. They're all around the entrance. Ah. 
the, the car came down the street. My mother said, let's go. And we did. Mm. We went across the road. They, the, the four flyers shook hands with us, spoke with us, didn't care about the people around and wanted to chat. That's lovely. It was fantastic. And mm. that set me off yeah. and wanted to go in the airport. That's amazing, isn't it? So you started in the Army and then you went to the Air Force. So what did you do? Where, where did you want to go in the Air Force? Um, well, I wanted to be um, a wireless operator. Yep. Morse code, yes. things like that. Mm. And uh, part of a, an air crew. And that's how it developed. Mm. Eight months of training. Yes. The wireless operator was the toughest course. Yeah. No. To be taught in the Air Force. Yeah. And um, what was Morse code like? Was that hard to learn and decipher? It was a case of repeating. Da da a, da 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 b, da 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 c, da 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 da, for a few hours every day. You can do it blindfolded. No worry. And that's really was a really big intricate part that Morse code because. That's how you communicated, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely. Everything, every signal, words of Air Force Station to another one, anywhere, was done with Morse code. Where did you learn that? Was that here at the RAF? I did that in Sydney. Sydney, yeah. And uh, Melbourne at Point Cook. Oh, okay. Yes. And uh, that came into, uh, when, I'm jumping ahead here, but I need to. yes. 30 Squadron formed in 1942. Yes. And we didn't have any aeroplanes. They were coming from Britain to be assembled here. Yes. Called a bow fighter. Okay. We'd never heard of it. But they weren't here. They hadn't arrived. Yeah. So here were we, fellas, a whole squadron, 300 of us, Yes. Not having anything to do. <laughs> Just walking around enjoying things. Till they all woke up and said, Listen, you've got to help out all the wireless operators, go to the signal office to help them there. Yep. And uh, engines, you go to the uh, other place here, that shed there, and so on. They occupied us. Hmm. And uh, that was terrific. And where were you then? Was that in Sydney or was it out at Richmond? Right Rich- here at Richmond. Yeah. Um, I um, was seconded on to do, uh, in the signal station to uh, face a big uh, receiver of messages from all over right. in Morse code. Yeah. And I was just dialing in case an aircraft was in trouble. We'd know where it was and what to do. Yeah. So on this special occasion at 2 o'clock in the morning, mind you, night night shift. Yes. Loud Morse code hit me in the ears. The only thing was I couldn't understand it. It didn't make our letters. Right. They were not out. Wasn't our Morse code. Was it your Morse code? Wow. So then it hit me like a ton of bricks, Japanese. Yeah. So I screamed out as Japanese gear. Everyone came running. We had a direction finding station, two of them, who pinpointed where the signal was coming from, where that moor started. Yeah. It was at Sydney Heads. It was the mothership right. for the midget submarines that came into the harbour. And you and you heard that? Through my headphones. Yeah. Now... We got. To, we knew where where it was. We had a Lockheed Hudson bombed up on standby all the time. Yeah. At Richmond. Yes. And they went uh, searching down at the heads. Yes. Couldn't find the sub. No. Naturally, it just submerged. Yeah, that's right. Head. Yes. Had dropped the midgets off into the harbour. Hmm. The um, harbour had a mesh. Fence across the harbour from South Head to Middle Head. Yes. Big one. And it went down the gate in the middle that dropped into the seabed. 
Mm. So the Manly Ferries could get through and keep running. Wow. And that's how the Medjus came in. Yeah. When they were dropped off by the big sub. Yes. The, uh, they just followed the Manly Ferries in through the, into the harbour. Oh, okay. And that's where the very things happened. Yeah. Mm. yeah. One American warship, big one, mm. the Chicago, mm. was moored in the channel in into Sydney, mm. the harbour. Had they been destroyed, Sydney was finished with the war. Yes. Didn't use any shipping, anything. Yeah. But uh, uh, the uh, midgets, one of them got caught up in the mesh, mm. destroyed, they blew themselves up. One of them just disappeared. No one knew what had happened to them. Yeah. Until about seven or eight years ago, they found the they did. little sub at Newport yeah. Yeah. on the little island there. Yeah. Uh, but then the other one was left and lined up on the warship yeah. to blow it up and block Sydney Harbour. Oh, okay. But they made a mistake. Two men on the submarine fired point blank at this big warship. But they had the settings on the torpedoes set too low. Mm. And they went underneath the ship. Ah. Oh. Didn't even hit it. Ah. Oh. One torpedo went onto the land. Yes. The other hit it. Ferry boat commandeered by the Australian Navy. Mm. Twenty Australian sail- sailors were struck with that torpedo and were killed. Oh, that's sad. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean... It's Just a little bit of a say. But a okay. Wallace operator mm. which one came... Through my headphones. Yes. Mm. And you were the one who heard and was able to get that out, that warning. Yeah. That, that was happening. Yeah. yeah. So what happened with the bow fighters when they came in from England? I mean, you had to get them all assembled so that you could get... Yes, they did that at Mascot. Okay. Not Victoria. Yeah. Mm. Mascot. Mm. And uh, I went for a flight with two bow fighters. Yeah. Uh, George Sayers. I forget who was in the other one. And uh, I was there too. I went too. We left Richmond. We headed down the Hawkesbury River. Yeah. Round every bend, North and Caddy. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, good speed we were travelling. Huh. But the thing was, no higher than that roof. Wow. That's how high that plane, those two planes were. Yeah. And they went round every bend, Rock and Kenny. It was such a wonderful aeroplane. Yes. Could do these things. Low flying. Yes. Yes. And uh, not only that, their engines were so quiet, called, they had sleeve, sleeve valves in the engine. Yes. And you couldn't hear the plane. An aeroplane, and you couldn't hear it coming. Mm. That was to our great advantage. I was going to say that would have given you the advantage Absolutely. of sneaking up. Wouldn't Absolutely. Mm. And so these planes went out in a broken bay into the ocean, dropped a green marker in the sea, and fired a few shots and came back the yeah. same way. Yeah. And that's how they operated from then on. Yeah. And they become wonderful mm. air crews and with a magnificent aeroplane. It was just absolutely wonderful. Yeah. So <laughs> with um, the squadron that you then, the 30 squadron that you're in for the bow fighters, how many people were in that squadron? 300. 300. Yeah. yeah. We uh, got the call one day in about July, put your summer uniforms on. In July? In July, mm. and we all formed up 300 of us, a column of three, 300 in the base here. Yes, at Richmond. Richmond. Yep. All of 30 squadron. Yep. We were armed with a rifle, bayonet, tin hat, slouch hat like a soldier. Yep. Just the same. Mm. And the Air Force summer uniform on. 
So we knew we were going somewhere that was pretty hot. Yes. So, right. Where did you go? Well, we went from here to Clarendon Station. Yes. And uh, they had an old train there with 1,900 carriages on it. Mm. There were straw seats, but we were there for a few hours until it got dark. Yeah. And, and it kept travelling through the night. Yes. And came to a town in the morning, daylight. We pulled in there for a while, and um, there was a chemist shop just at, near the station. So we went in, bought tins of uh, Johnson's baby powder. Oh, okay. Put on our toes to stop tinnier. Oh. We were young airmen working yeah. this out ourselves. Yes. So, and I've got photos of us, the four of us with a holding up a tin of uh, yeah. baby That's powder. Cool. That's cool. Anyway. Uh, and where was that? We went back into the chemist and said, where are we? Yes. He said, you're at Kempsey. So we stopped at Kempsey overnight. Yeah. <laughs> then we went on from there to Brisbane, two days to get to Brisbane from here. Oh. And uh, had all our gear. And then went from there after a few days to Townsville. Yes. And uh, the aircraft then went to a little place outside Townsville in the bushland called Bowley River. Oh. Bowley River. Yeah. That became our password in our squadron, Bowley River. Yeah. And uh, the aircraft trained there and trees round about north. And similar things to the, the tropics. Yes. And then we went from there. First of all, started off, sent three aircraft to help at Milne Bay, which they did. They kept the, the Japanese Navy quiet. I better tell you about the armament on the plane. Yeah. In the nose, under the pilot, were four cannons. 20 mil cannons yeah. that fired high explosion um, and um, different things. Um, incendiary set things, could set ships yeah. afire. Yeah. That's incendiary and high explosion and, and so on. Yeah. And in the wings, they had six machine guns. Oh, wow. So the most heavily armed aeroplane. It would be, yeah. And they used it like that too. Mm. It was just so uh, magnificent. Everyone, Wait, everyone many, loved their aeroplane. How many um, people could get into the aeroplane? Like, how many no, did it hold? Two. Two. On three. Yeah. I've been threes. Mm. And um, and it it uh, could do what you wanted it to do. Well. And was it a smaller plane? Uh, that sort of bow fighter than the others, and that's why it could manoeuvre so much? Well, it wasn't small. No. It was um, fairly big. Mm. Two engines. Oh, okay. And uh, it it um, did what it was supposed to do. Yep. And it, they flew in groups and uh, to a target, and they were on the target. The Japanese had no idea they were coming because they couldn't hear them. Oh. So then they would get in quickly to destroy aircraft on the ground and all that sort of thing. Yes. And uh, and get back to base. Yeah. They were fast too. Mm. So they were a remarkable aeroplane. Mm. <laughs> Nobody knows much about them now, but they were, they'd be an asset today. Mm. They are only... About four in the whole world left now. Oh, really? Where are they? Uh, then England's got one, I think. Yeah. And partial, partial ones. Yes. America's got got one that we, our squadron, paid for the uh, the uh, aircraft museum down the coast. Yes. To restore, to fly. Hmm. And uh, unfortunately for us, the Americans said, we'll do a trade with you. Mm. But the people didn't know about that. Mm. 
and we got a super constellation out here to see. Carried a lot of people. Yes. But uh, we didn't know there was a trade-off. The Americans took the Bavhoda. Oh, okay. So they put the yeah. Bavhoda, which flew yes. at that time. Yeah. So there's not much left now. There's a bow fighter at uh, Norellan, Camden. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's one in uh, Moorabbin in Victoria. Mm. They don't fly. No. But they're there with all the ends. Good to see them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can go and see them. You're in the war. What other areas did you go to? You said there was a few battles that you did. Well, oh, yes. I've only told you about Kukata and I. And yesterday, you've no, you've tried to describe how terrible it could be. Mm. And these Australians only had their water bottle and a few scraps of this and that. Yeah. Hard biscuits and so on. Yeah. To keep going. Yeah. And the Japanese pushed them from the north to the south of New Guinea. Yes. And it looked as though they were going to get down from there yeah. to Moresby Arbor. Which was so important region. to hold that off, was Absolutely. It? Yes. And uh, it, it went that way. I myself went up being Air Force, not supposed to. I jumped a truck. Every truck would stop, pick you up. Went up a mountainside, which was, um, I suppose, the back wheels of the truck would only be, wouldn't be two feet. Yep. Uh, or... There's so many centimetres. Yeah. And uh, from there, going up the mountainside, I have looked down from the back of that truck, straight down, that's how close, on yes. the edge, Yes. in the truck. And there were trucks lying down there, gone over the edge. That didn't make Australian trucks. Oh, dear. Yeah. A thousand feet down. Yeah. Boom. Mm. So, so was... it was so scary to get there. Yeah. So did you actually um, go on the trail itself or? Oh, yes, yes. yeah. But I, I didn't see a Jap. I had my rifle. Mm. I had all the gear. Yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, but then I did it twice. I felt I was giving them a hand. And yeah. I had been, had army training. Yes. That was okay. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, Finally, the Japanese ran out of food and they cannibalised their, their dead soldiers with hot steaks and things. Yeah. This has been published. It's not new me saying it. Yeah. But uh, people, they, they, the Australians knew this and um, so that they ran out of food. I have a communique in one of our magazines well, where one of our pilots had come back yeah. and they they are debriefed when they come back yes. to say what they did and so forth. And then a, a, an army debriefing officer came in and said, just found all this Japanese am- ammunition and food riddled with bowfighter bull- bullets. Oh. So the uh, bowfighters assisted yeah. the army enormously. Yes. The chaps were two days from Moresby. Yep. Could see the lights on the warmth down there yep. in way up in the mountain. And their boss said, we'll be there in two days. Yep. They didn't get there. No. And we're lucky they didn't. Yeah. Yes. So the Army and the Air Force worked together. Yeah. Quite a bit. Yeah. Especially the next occasion after Kukata Trek was called the Battle of the... Of the bulge. Yep. Because uh, the Japanese then were trying to uh, land their army from ships at Buna, Gona, and San Ananda, mm. two places on the coast of New Guinea. Yep. So that they could march up the coast to a place called Lai, which was yeah. just up the coast a bit. Right. There was already an army there, Japanese there, oh, another one landing from the ships. Yeah. And uh, 
they were going to uh, uh, build the Dalits out of the Australians. The Australians did put an American battalion and it, they did fail. Mm. They wouldn't, didn't want any more to do. Yeah. So they're all Australian soldiers. Yeah. And in one spot, they were pinned down, the Australians. The uh, Japanese had them from a hill so that the Australians were locked in. Mm. They signalled to headquarters who got in touch with the bad fighters. Yes. The, the soldiers put smoke signals where they had to strap, mm. and they did. And when it was all over, the Australians just went straight through and found 600 dead Japanese on that hill, mm. just in the bad fighters' fire. Yeah. So they collaborated with the armies. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Now, and just digressing a little, just uh, when COVID came on a few years ago, five ex-servicemen from us all over Australia, only five, were chosen to go to Canberra to commemorate Kokoda Track and that big battle. Yes. Only five, I was one of them. That oh, were really you? Oh, and, wow. And uh, we were presented with photographs and the government, veteran affairs and all sorts of people, yeah. met everybody, went to the war memorial, all those things and so yeah. And then, again, I'll just touch this a little bit. Then the, the uh, other big battle, uh, we commemorated that too, went at a separate time. There were 12 of us on this occasion, only 12 out of Australia. What? We had to be reasonably knowledgeable of what went on. And what year was that in? About five years ago now. Yeah, right, OK. Yeah. Just recent. Yeah, right. Uh, they provided everything for us. Yeah. And I have two daughters. Yes. Judy and Penny. Mm. And each of them went on one of those trips. That's oh. my carer. Yeah. So they had, they came to Well. And that was good. But I digress there. That's OK. And... Uh, the, uh, the Army 10, 30 Squadron, was carrying on all their attacks, etc., with great success. Yes. We moved from Port Moresby to um, a little island called Good Enough Island. Good oh, Enough. Good Enough. Lovely name, is it? It is, it is. Good Enough Island. Was it Good Enough? Yes, it was the loveliest little resort, <laughs> except that you had enemy trying to get there. Mm. They had been there yeah, and driven off by the Australians. And um, that, that was quite a thing. And uh, I was only speaking to a good friend this morning that in that place you could uh, be walking along the airstrip or anywhere at all there and just a few thickets of timber here and there. Most beautiful butterflies in the world oh, that really? you have ever seen. Yeah. So we all made a stick with a bit of wire and a bit of a mosquito net yes. and went chasing butterflies. butterflies. That's lovely. Just, just, just a little aside. Yeah. And we made it up cigarette packs, cut them with size and so on and pinned them here. Yeah. Butterfly there, they were very large. Yes. Beautiful colours, never seen colours like that. I had two, I brought two of them home, and um, where they've gone now, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> where the good butterflies go. Oh. But um, yes, that was just in passing there at Good Enough. Yeah. At Good Enough, too, I'm jumping from close to oh, right. uh, how far was good enough away from Australia? Well, Moresby is only 300 or kilometres. Yeah. It's not far away. No, no, very close. And um, good enough was a little bit further. Yep. There were three islands, Ferguson, get the other one, and good enough. Mm. You could stand here and see the three islands. Yep. It was that close. All oh, right. We had, as a recreation, 
Now, we were having sorties on, you know, every, every day, going out in boat fighters to destroy barges yep. that were loading Japanese stores oh, okay. onto yep. that little island. Good enough island, only about nine miles long. Oh, sweet. Yet on that island, there were mountains higher than Kosciuszko in Australia. Mm. And uh, we decided to have a race between 22 Squadron yeah. and 30 Squadron. Yes. 22 Squadron with their Boston bombers. Yes. And 30 Squadron with their bow fighter. Yep. And we went to a little island called Woodlark Island. Mm. In the distance, you couldn't uh, you couldn't see them. They were so far away. Mm. And uh, we took all the heavy stuff out of both planes. Each squadron did their own. And uh, off they set. They had another bow fighter to describe the race <laughs> okay. in the air. Yeah. So the word came and we were up on the slopes of Goodna, big mountain slopes. Yep. And just looking, couldn't see anything. Yeah. And then two little dots came into view. Yeah. The fellow that was there to describe the race was so far behind, he just gave up. <laughs> and the planes came closer and closer so that eventually you could pick out a bow fighter and a Boston. Yeah. They're both lovely planes. And uh, as they got closer, the last 10, say 15 kilometres, yep. the bow fighters started to pull away. Yeah. And it was the first plane to go across the duty pilot's power on the airstrip. So, so they won, won, the, won the race. Won the race. I, I won 10 shillings that day <laughs> from that mate of mine. We trained together as well as I rode. Yeah. But he was in 22 squadron and I was in 30. Yeah. So he had to pay me 10 shillings. Yeah. And that, That's good. And that, what other sort of things did you do to pass the time? Um, well, we, we had a baseball team. Yep. Yeah. I played baseball. Yeah. Uh, against the Americans. Okay. And they, they were good times. Mm. Relaxation. Yes. And we'd have a head of cricket now and again or mm. do this, that and the other. Did well, you try to teach the Americans how to play cricket? No, I'm afraid not. <laughs> no, no. Probably wouldn't be possible. <laughs> yeah, look, here's a thing. I'm jumping ahead a bit because I haven't come to the Bismarck Sea yet. No, you haven't. No. So Say it now. Well, um, when the Australians were decimating the Japanese fleet of 16 ships, yep. 12 were sunk, fill the aeroplanes against their army. Mm. Had a whole army on those ships. Yeah. And firing their rockets and machine guns into these ships yeah. and the communique I've got a copy of the communique yeah. from an Air Force headquarters that they had to destroy the Japanese bridges yes which would um, kill the pilot yes the uh, captain yes and then use their uh, rafing fire and uh, <laughs> blew up portions of the ship and killed all the uh, anti-aircraft crews. Yes. And left the ship blazing. Completely knocked them out. Yep. And I jumped forward to say that the Bismarck Sea Battle. Yes. And this is what I was going to tell you. And nobody knows about it but me. I was listening out. Listening out means I've got headphones on. I'm listening to our fellas. If they're in trouble, I've got to know about it. Well, so I've let certain things be done. Anyway, all I could get in my headphones was American voices. They were, they were bombers, and I, 
I'm jumping ahead and I don't know. No, no, you're fine. And uh, they had uh, they had the airwaves. The Americans had the airwaves. All I could hear was American voices mm. from their bombers. There were about eight different bombers Americans were using. I'll explain later about that. Yep. Uh, and uh, they, all their voices, look at those bow fighters. Look at... They're going to let Freddy around in there, bombs are dropping around them. And, that. and then Americans had a saying, sons of bitches. Yeah. was one of their common sayings. Yeah. But they were saying that to the Australian flyers mm. that they were loving. It was in a loving tone. Yes. They were loving those Australians. If only it could have been recorded. Here it was, another nation, the Americans, just loving with their voices and the things they said. Yeah. Were just wonderful. Yeah. And I was the only one listening to it. Yeah. It was terrible. It should have been recorded. Uh, but uh, we didn't have recorders then. Oh, uh, well, you've recorded it. You remember it. But anyway, that, that, that was that. That's yeah. the best mark to see about it. I'm coming into that now. Yeah. And uh, Bismarck Sea Battle, we had uh, spotters in the jungle who could wire us back and tell us what the Japanese ships were doing. Yeah. And uh, they were getting this fleet ready with, with 16 ships with an army on it. Yeah. To get to uh, Lay, and the weather was... Uh, not good. They thought, how on earth are we going to stop them? Yeah. They've got the numbers. This is a remarkable thing. An Australian, Bill Gehring. Yeah. Yeah, well, good friend. Yeah. Most remarkable battle ever fought in the whole of world time. Yeah. This battle, mm. done and tell you, I described bit of it there, and he devised a plan to really knock the ships out. Well, the Americans were at a loss. They had no one could do anything. Yeah. Normal bombing wasn't effective. Is that because you knew the area so well, do you think? Uh, well, he did, yeah. but he had been in Britain. Yeah. He won the Victoria, not the Victoria, the uh, Air Force... Um, declaration anyway, yes. DFC, and uh, then came out to Australia. He was a group captain. Yeah. He was here in this base. There's a street called Gearing Street. Yeah. Named after him. Yep. Bill Gearing. He thought out a plan to, uh, t to get rid of these people. Yep. And the American... Uh, I command took him to General MacArthur, mm. who was in charge of all forces in the Pacific, mm. the South Pacific. Yeah. And uh, put the plan, Bill Gehring's plan to him. He said, go ahead, do it. Now, the amazing thing is that they had to go to a place along the coast and do certain training, yeah. accuracy and bombing and all this sort of thing. Yeah. And uh, with the Americans, they had to do it, and the Australians. Yes. And his plan now was to attack the enemy fleet in waves. Mm. How did he do it? He got all the Allied airplanes, bad fighters, Boston's, you name them, fortresses and liberators, all the other aircraft, marauders and so on. And they built a chimney into the sky, like a big pole straight up in the sky, but just like a, just like a chimney, yeah. uh, hollow inside. Yes. Which is all, all only aeroplanes. It's, it's made of 
of aeroplanes, see? Eh? Oh, okay. Now, the first layer of that was bay fighters. Yep. Third squadron. Yep. And the next one, 22 with their uh, Boston bombers. Yep. Then the marauders. Then the this, then the that, and finally the super fortresses. Yep. Right up on top, this big cotton. Yeah. So all flying along like this. Wow. Nothing's ever been done like that. Yeah. People don't know about that sort of yeah. thing. And uh, then it got half past nine, both fighters out, get out. So they're the, on the bottom. Yep. They flew off at sea level. True. And faced the enemy ships coming who thought, they were torpedo bombers. The bay, they thought the bay fighters were torpedoes. So they turned their ships from broad to straight ahead. Yes. Which just suited the bay fighters down to the ground. <laughs> so in they went, and they set every ship afire, yeah. destroyed the bridges, the crews, and so on. Then each layer of that chimney went off at its time. Hmm. Ten o'clock, you're right, get. They dropped their bombs. Yep. So, so um, they sank uh, 12 out of ship to 16 ships. Hmm. Purely an Air Force show, of course. Oh. And uh, remarkable to hear it over the air it was fantastic. Hmm. They're all your mates see. Yep. And um, it, um, McCarthy, I should have uh, brought his words, so I have them. Mm. But he said that he, uh, it was the greatest of all battles ever won in any war. Yeah. And it was done with aeroplanes. Yeah. And, uh, and so on. Yeah. So, and, and 30 squadron got, DSO and seven TFCs in that particular, yeah. um, but they all they're all good. So you listening on though in that battle when that was going on, that must have been amazing. Huh. Hearing all of the talk and the chatter from you know the Americans and the Australians and how they were going and the talk exactly. between them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was amazing. Yeah, because. It, one in a lifetime thingy. Yeah. And they would have had an excitement about how well they were doing. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, oh, they knew how well. The, because all this, every one of them was burning. Yeah. Yeah. Now, 22 Squadron was there. They, they were a bomber. Mm. They had to go to uh, Lay mm. and drop their bombs on the runways where the planes took off. Yep. So that their fighters couldn't get off, couldn't get off the ground. Yeah, they did a wonderful job. Then they, they then went after the the next day, and uh, assisted in in destroying one ship. So it was, it was wonderful. So how long did the whole battle take? How how long did that go for? Uh, well, it was one, and uh, yeah, I heard Bill Gehring say this. And I'm next to him. Yep. Hell on the table. 28 minutes. In 28 minutes, that battle was won. That's amazing, isn't it? There's never been a battle like that before. Yeah. And uh, he's so unassuming, sort of. Uh, but a nice, bright fella. Mm. He's, not, he's not living now. No. But um, now and then, we... One of our fellows said, um, rang me up and said, listen, you live closer to Richmond than any of us. Any of us. Mm. Uh, write a letter to the CEO of the base. They had a base commander then. And uh, tell him we'd like to get a plaque on the gates, the big gates, to say that 30 Squadron had been here and gone mm. to the war. And uh, and I did that. Yep. And the uh, CEO got the letter, 
and gave it to Cameron Smith, who was a minister, yep. a, a padre, yeah. on the base here. Yeah. There were three, um, Cameron Smith and uh, Murray Earl and Bill Fuller, yeah. three of them. So did you live around here, did you? No, Castle Hill. Castle Hill, yeah. So of seeing everything that you have seen and we've now got young people around, I mean, the history is so important, isn't it, to keep it alive and to let them know what's happened? Well, we must let them know because Australia nearly lost the war. Yeah. If it hadn't won those five battles, yeah. we were sunk. Yeah. They had won. <laughs> and our... Our boys in my unit, yep. we could never understand that just freakishness yep. that Australia came out on top, mm. and that that was Australian mm. American big bombers help. Yeah. That uh, it's our history, and we don't teach it in schools. Yeah. And my ship object is to get it into schools, yeah. get it into our history. Right. Yeah. And it was so uh, so close to losing the war. Yeah. No one knows how yeah. it was now that we'd be speaking Japanese. And, like, with all the kids and, like, how it's changed so much in all t- what you've seen, Bruce, in your life, what would you say to the young people of today? Well, you've got to be vigilant. Yeah. You've got to be uh, yourself. You're not to argue amongst yourselves. Well... You've got to uh, you've got to pay attention to things. Yes. And for instance, we fought the Japanese. Yep. I had a rifle to kill the Japanese. He had a rifle to kill me. Yep. We were at war. That's right. Today, he's our best friends. Well, Japanese. There you go. We were going to kill you. You're going to kill us. Look at that. Yep. Now, we've got to do something about that. Mm. Not let this happen again. That's right. Don't let it happen. Don't just go to war. Don't let someone lead you to war. Mm. Don't let it happen. That's wonderful. Now, you've got to learn this in school. Yes. Schools have got to wake up. The education department is at war. There's no mention of anything. Well, Australia nearly became Japanese. That's it. Yeah. All well, those is a whisker. Yeah. Do you know, I've um, really appreciated speaking with you today and <laughs> the time that you've had with me. I could sit here for hours and talk to you, but we won't have hours of filming to do that. <laughs> but look, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time and thank uh, you so much pleasure to meet you for doing you everything you've done. Really, thank you. Thank you. We, we, we don't think that way. We know we've been to a war and yes. we've helped, but we don't do it for any glamour or anything. No, I know like you that. didn't. I know that.